Today we are going to talk about op amp integrator circuits. So we've gone over op amps in different ways before, but now we're going to show how you can use them to actually be an integrator and where you'd use that. I don't know, but it's important. So we'll go over it. So first thing, I just want to go over integration really quick. So with integration, the idea is if it's been a couple of years since you've done any calculation is to find the area under the curve. So it's something that if you have a constant input like that, as you are going this direction, the area under the curve increases. So if this is your input, then your output will increase like that as you are constantly increasing the area under your curve. So, so with circuits, the idea of area under the curve is that any positive voltage will cause the output to have a bigger positive voltage. And then if you go into a negative voltage, it will actually drop your voltage. So now on this example, if we were to go like that, then immediately, let's make that at least somewhat even, immediately, we're going to start going down like that, because now all of this area is a negative area. So that is going to be measuring the negative area under the voltage or under the line. And so you're going to be going down like that. Now, this is not at all supposed to be a replacement for years and years of calculus and stuff like that. But just the general idea as a reminder is that this integration circuit that we're going to be going over is going to be measuring the area under the curve and giving us an output that is indicative of that. And as one more example, before we get into the circuit itself, if you remember that you take the integral of sine, it's cosine, the integral of cosine, it's sine, stuff like that. You can see like if you have a this sign here and it probably is easier to show it if I went the other way. Um, let's say we start with cosine that starts up here and then oh, oh, let's see how well I can do this. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. The idea is though, if you have cosine, it starts up here. As you're moving across, you're increasing the area under this as you're going along, but it's getting smaller amounts of area. So as your sine wave comes up, it's getting bigger and bigger, but it's also not increasing as much. But then as soon as you hit zero, the inflection point for your sine wave, which is again, the integral of cosine, it starts to go down again, because again, you're losing the area under that curve. And then once you start decreasing here, you get that inflection in the curve. But once you cross here, that's where your sine wave comes back up and you're losing that space. But again, the idea is here that we are integrating a signal and we're taking all the vo positive voltage and measuring it and finding that area under the curve. But then if the voltage becomes negative, our output actually starts decreasing again. Okay, now with that very, very terrible integral calculus overview, let's go to the circuit itself. Okay, so now we have our integrator circuit and it looks much like your typical inverting feedback, non-inverting amplifier circuit, there we go. You have your input resistor, but instead of this feedback resistor, you get a feedback capacitor. And so this feedback capacitor obviously is not going to act like a normal resistor because a capacitor at DC acts as a block and won't pass any voltage, whereas at AC, it acts as an, uh, excuse me, as a closed, and it'll let any signal pass through without any problem. And then in between, that's where you get to have a little bit of fun with the math. But the idea here is that as your voltage is changing and you've got your virtual ground here where your two inputs are tied together, remember, no current going into these inputs and the, and the output of your op amp will drive this to zero at all times, or excuse me, not drive it to zero at all times. It will make sure that these two inputs are the same voltage. And in this case, with our non-inverting input connected to ground, it will be forcing this input to zero. So what you're doing is if you have any change of input here, your output is trying to change this node right here to be zero volts. And as always, any current going here has to be matched here. Okay, reminder that a capacitor, it's dependent on the change in the voltage. That the change in the voltage over it is how you will know how much current is going through it. C, D, V, D, T. Remember, change in voltage over change in time times the capacitance. That's how we get the relationship between the currents that go through here. So let's go over this a little bit mathematically. I don't want to get into it too much. I do just want to 
make sure that we go over it fundamentally and understand. And then I've got this all set up and we'll actually show this in action with a variety of waveforms. And I think it's pretty cool. For me, it helps a lot to see it practically done. See, oh, this is literally what's happening there. So we'll get to that. But first, let's go over how we come up with this equation where we find out V out. Okay, like all of our other op amp circuits that we've gone over, we know that this current is the same as this current. So we can find this current right here and we'll just call it I. I call those RF and CF because of the resistor feedback and the capacitor feedback, but it's the only resistor and the only capacitor, so maybe I should have left them out to keep it simpler. I don't know. But in this case, we know that I here is simply Vn minus zero because that's tied to ground virtually over RF. So let's just say Vn over R. And then we know that that current is going to be the same thing, except we're not going to use Ohm's law because Ohm's law doesn't work with capacitors. We are going to use the fact that we know that current through capacitor is C times the change in voltage over the change in time. And so we will have CF times dV, and we want to say dV out in this time. Oh, dang it, I changed that. Change in, because it is a change in this voltage, so that's going to be zero minus V out, that is very important, over the change in time, dt. And so this is our initial equation that we have to work with, uh, relating these two currents together. So let's look at that for a moment. That makes sense. Current going through there is the same as the voltage change over there times CF. Good to go. So now how does this become this? How do we get that V out out of there and all by itself? That's where we have to integrate it on both sides uh, to eliminate that. And that's where we get the integrator circuit. So let's do some math here really quick. Integrate that on both sides. So let's just say zero to whatever time we have. Vn over Rf equals integral of zero to t. CF, D, we'll just drop that zero, negative V, and I'm just going to put VO instead of V out to make it shorter, D, T. Okay, if you remember anything from integral calculus, you can take all of your, all of your constants out of the integral, and that will make things quite a bit simpler. And since we're wanting to get that V out on its own, let's move the negative and the CF over to the other side. So we will divide it by divide both sides by our capacitance and by that negative one. So we will get oh negative one over CF RF pulling that out of the integral to make it simpler zero to T VN equals the integral zero to T of D V zero over d t. Okay, just integrated both sides, moved the constants over there so we didn't have to worry about them. And then we just know that the integral of a derivative is uh, basically your original thing plus a constant. Now in this case, we're just gonna assume that the, um, the original voltage is zero. So that is quite literally just v zero. Makes things very, very simple. Okay. Now, sometimes people can see those integral signs and it scares them. We didn't do anything special here. All we did is we took this derivative with the change of that voltage and we wanted to get rid of it so that we could have our output, everything in regards to that output V0. And all we did was integrate over on this side. Now, this is helpful for you to know what's going on and explains things mathematically. But again, it's much more important that you get an intuitive idea of what's going on and that is simply that the output is simply the inverse, remember that negative sign, the inverse of one over your feedback resistance times your feedback capacitance times the change in your input voltage, or excuse me, not the change in your input voltage. Here I'm trying to be clear and I may mess it up. Times the integral of your input voltage. All this is saying is that your output is simply the area under the input. So anytime it's above zero or below zero, it's going to go add one way or the other times one over the feedback resistance times the feedback capacitance. That actually sounds maybe even still a little bit confusing, uh, 
But if you keep that in mind, and we'll try and go over it one more time after we go over this, it should make a lot of sense. And then you just look at this and you can plug in the numbers. You, if you have your V in, you can plug in those numbers, integrate it. You, RFCF, simple, simple addition multiplication, very, very straightforward. But I do want to make sure that you understand that. So let's jump into the example um, of the different things and what this is looking like here. And then we will get back, review the concept one more time, and then finish this whole thing up. Now, this is actually a little bit more complicated because we had to hook it up to the oscilloscope and the function generator and the power supply, and we actually did need a negative voltage on here. So we're gonna go over the setup here really quick. The input here, uh, our power supply to the op amp itself is at negative 10 volts. Our power supply to the op amp is now positive 10 volts. And I tied the ground rails to the middle at zero volts. So that's, uh, it was a little bit more complicated, but other than that, this is quite straightforward we tied our non-inverting input here to ground at that zero volts. Our input here is tied to both the oscilloscope and the waveform generator, so we can both see the in and the output here. And it's going through this about 5,000 um, ohm resistor, and then it goes to the inverting input, which is then connected to the output via this capacitor. And then I have another oscilloscope input that I will just probe directly into the output so that we can see how that's going. So this is what it looks like on the breadboard. And it looks, well, basically it's exactly what was on the sheet of paper as well, so should be good to go. But let's now look at the power supply and the input and output. Okay, so our input's just going to be one kilohertz, five volts peak to peak. It's going to be going, um, currently it's a sine output, but I'll switch that actually to a square, to a square wave and we'll go through the different ones, but this is actually five volts peak to peak, so it's plus 2.5 volts minus 2.5 volts. We'll see how the input is measured on the oscilloscope, and then we'll see what the output looks like, and we will start messing with things. All right, here we have the yellow line as the input, which is that square wave that I was talking about, and we have the blue line as the output. You can see very easily that as the um, voltage drops and becomes negative, since the signal is inverted, you get an increase, and then as soon as the voltage is high, again, because it's multiplied by a negative one over R RFCF, that it immediately starts to drop down again. So that is exactly what we'd expect on the output uh, with this square wave. Now, the interesting thing is let's switch it and let's have a ramp input. So that is, the, again, the yellow is the input, and it's a ramp input with the blue as the output you can see that the inflection points on the sine wave output are equal, not necessarily to the, the top and the bottom of the ramp sign, but it's where it crosses the zero. So it crosses the zero there and it starts to become more negative. And since it's inverted, that's exactly where it starts to become more positive right there. So that's pretty cool. And then if you have a sine wave, it does the same way, or it does the same thing. You can see that these are two basically sine waves, but out of phase from each other. And that's where you get that sine to cosine and cosine to sine changes when you integrate a circuit. So that's about it. I think those are some pretty cool examples, but I would like to point out a few things that you may have already noticed. The blue is moving. It kind of goes all over the place. It floats up, it floats down. And that's because, oh, well, just did it for me right there. That was quite nice. It does that because you have those input bias voltages that we've discussed in previous videos. And so the op amp isn't perfect, and this circuit assumes an ideal and perfect op amp. In real life, if you want a, an integrator circuit that works properly, you need to have some way to reset it for when it goes crazy like this. And you can do that with uh, feedback resistors and other little mechanisms but that is something you definitely need to worry about in a real life application. Another thing that you need to worry about is that there are bandwidth limitations on this. So we're currently at 1000 kilohertz, but as we increase that, you can see that the output actually is getting smaller and smaller and it's looking more like just a flat line. Um, you, you still get a ripple, but the peak to peak on the output is significantly less. And then as we go the other direction, and let me get this farther down, I'll have to change my view quite a bit. You can see that the output just looks horrible. And that's me not changing anything except for the frequency input. 
And so you can tell that this is very independent. And that's not just an op amp thing, that's also your feedback resistor and your feedback capacitor relationship. So those two things will affect what your circuit like looks like and you'll have to tweak it. Okay, so we just went over and we saw practically what it looks like. So again, I just wanna go over briefly, again, conceptually what's going on here. Your output is simply going to be the inverse of the integral of your input. That's it. Any input that's above zero, you're gonna start, since it's inverted, start getting a more negative number. Any input that is below zero volt, it's gonna start getting to be a bigger number. And you've got to make sure that you remember that inverse relationship or you're gonna be quite confused. So ideally, if you have a zero input on your, in, on your input, your output should be zero. But because there is that bias, it'll start to float a little bit. And that's something you need to deal with in real life. But again, in a perfect situation, if the input is zero volts, your output should also be zero or stay the same if you've already had a previous above or below volt, above or below zero voltage on the input. Okay, that's pretty cool. I, I admit integrator was difficult for me when I was learning about it. It was just a strange relationship I didn't really understand, but it's a fun circuit and it's a lot of fun for me to see it in real life and see how it works. So I really hope this was both interesting to you and also made it a lot more understandable and intuitive to you on how this circuit works and what's going on. If it did, please give us a like, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. If it didn't, if you have any questions, please leave it below in the comments and we'd love to get back to you and figure out what we can do to help clarify things. Have a great one and we'll see you in the next one.